Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us on the Hemlock Willia Delgid pre tour webinar. We're going to get started um, with today's webinar. Um, I'm Lauren Bell. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center. Um, all registrants that are on today's webinar have been put into listen only mode, and the webinar is being recorded. So we will be putting that out on the Invasive Species Center YouTube page following this webinar. Um, and an email will go out to all registrants once the recording is available um, with a link to the YouTube page. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have throughout the webinar in the chat box. Um, if you are attending the field tour that's happening on November 7th and have any questions regarding the logistics of the tour, you can ask those in the chat box as well, or you can send me an email directly to answer any of those questions following the webinar. Please just take note of the time slot if you are attending this field tour of the time slot you have registered for and plan to arrive about 15 minutes ahead of your tour time to ensure we stay on time. Um, and if you have any uh, issues or have any need clarification on your registered time, you can email me as well. And my email will be, be available in the chat box. Um, I'll be posting it there. As well, you can find it on your tour registration email if you did sign up for a tour. Um, so today, we are, the Invasive Species Center is very happy to be partnering with Silvicon Limited and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to organize this webinar and the field tour. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our speaker today is Erin Appleton. Erin's the Plant Health Survey Biologist for Ontario with the Canadian Food Inspections Agency. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Erin. Wonderful. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks to everyone at the Invasive Species Centre for all the logistical support and organization in helping make this event happen. So it's very important today. Um, it's a first step in broadly sharing information on hemlock woolly adelgid to help enhance our knowledge base in Ontario with respect to hemlock woolly adelgid biology detection and monitoring. We're also hoping to increase awareness of hemlock woolly adelgid surveillance and reporting protocols. And overall, with our partners as well as CFI staff, we want to foster knowledge transfer and ongoing information sharing to support early detection of hemlock woolly adelgid in Ontario. So a bit of background to put the biological context into how we look for um, and address incursions of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, HWA is a hemipteran insect. It's an aphid-like piercing sucking feeder that produces a waxy wool as it develops and matures. It feeds by sucking the sap, um, which it pierces at the base of the needle, and overall it has low direct mobility. So this is something we take into account when designing and developing our surveys. It has an incredibly complex life cycle, so we'll get into that a bit as it pertains to our detection windows. So I really like this graphic uh, representation of the life cycle and the two generations that are present in North America. Um, it's it's a good one because it very clearly depicts uh, the cystin generation and how it is present for a much longer duration than the progridians generation and also shows the time at which these generations are present. So now we'll look at these more closely. The cistins generation is the overwintering generation. So the eggs of this generation hatch in late spring, and then the crawlers move to feed at the base of the needles. They then um, stay attached there for the remaining remainder of their life. Um, they slough off their appendages, and then they stay there, begin to estivate um, in the summer after the crawler stage is complete. So those nymphs, um, are the only estivating stage. And they're the stage that's transported by wind and wildlife, as well as on nursery stock. So again, we're now entering that active period for that stage um, where feeding and development begins in the fall. And um, thankfully, with our partnership with the United States, we have a lot of great information on when HWA has been breaking estivation. So we, we've seen the progression from the south up towards the northern states, knowing that um, it broke estivation around mid-October. Um, so the adults of this uh, generation lay up to 300 eggs in March. So this is the most significant generation as far as helping populations build. 
So the pergridians are the spring generation, and these eggs hatch in early spring. They do not undergo a diapause period. However, this stage is interesting because there are both winged and wingless forms. So the winged forms are actually um, the reproductive stage that leaves the hemlock host. This is the only mobile stage. And those that leave the hemlock host are actually terminated. So um, that results in incomplete development because we do not have the Japanese spruce host that they use as a primary host for that stage. So that cycle is broken. So it's only those wingless individuals that continue with the cycle. Those adults lay up to 75 eggs to then initiate the cistern's generation again. So looking at HWA as an invasive species, it is introduced, um, and we'll learn a bit more about its interesting uh, biology. It's regulated under the authority of the Plant Protection Act. And now this is where it gets interesting because it is native to North America, so the western coasts of Canada and United States, and it's also native to Eastern Asia. We do know that these are, are two different uh, strains, so to speak, of the pest. Um, it was first reported in Western North America and British Columbia in 1919, and then much later in Eastern North America in Virginia in 1951. So that was the first Eastern detection. It's naturally spread by wind, birds, and mammals. And um, there's a lot of scientific information now showing us that the, the biology and behavior is changing as it progresses northward. And so not only is it um, increasing its cold tolerance, but also the rate of spread is slightly decreasing where in the more southern latitudes, it was expected to disperse around 20 kilometers per year. However, now it's considered slower looking at about 12.5 kilometers per year. So that long distance dispersal happens via infected nursery stock. Um, and then we'll see in a moment how we have controls in place to prevent this. And then it's naturally spread by wind birds as well as mammals. So as I mentioned, there are Eastern and Western North American populations that are genetically distinct. And that Western population feeds on Western hemlock. However, damage is very limited, so it's not a concern for our colleagues in British Columbia and Western provinces because of the host resistance that's exhibited. Um, it is highly invasive in Eastern North America and therefore it's a significant pest of our Eastern hemlocks, including both Eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock. So the overall impact on trees is variable. However, it is caused by the action of that stylet being inserted into the twigs at the base of the needles, and then the feeding action on the xylem ray parenchyma cells. This causes bud death followed by needle loss and eventual tree mortality. We know that all sizes and ages of trees can be attacked However, drought and other factors such as moisture, um, soil composition can hasten the impacts of HWA. And generally the rate of tree mortality is var variable between four to 10 years, but this can be accelerated in drought conditions and times of stress. So ecological impacts. In Ontario, um, we have a different situation than other areas of Canada where our hemlock is um, a fairly patchy distribution. However, it is incredibly significant with respect to its ecological significance. So um, it is considered a foundation species by moderating stream water temperatures. It stabilizes shallow slopes, especially in steep gorges, which is significant for our Niagara site. And it provides a critical habitat for migratory birds and animals. So that's where we have the relationship um, with spread as well from the hemlock hosts that are habitats for these animals and then moving the adelgids to new areas. The mortality caused by hemlock woolly adelgid open stands to invasive plant species such as buckthorn and garlic mustard. Um, and the lost hemlock is likely to be replaced by mixed hardwood forest. So that will cause a loss in beta diversity as well. Logging of hemlock woolly adelgid infested forests forests, increase soil compaction, pH, nitrification rates, and biomass of woody debris. So we know overall there are pretty extensive ecological impacts. Okay. 
And that is why within the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, we've established regulations to mitigate the risks associated with this pest, slow the spread and protect non-infested areas of Canada. So the yellow areas of this map reflect infested places orders that have been issued to control the spread out of these infested regions. So we have a policy directive, DO705, which stipulates phytosanitary requirements to prevent the introduction and spread of hemlock woolly adelgid from the United States and within Canada. It outlines regulated articles for this pest, which include forest products with bark attached, plants for planting, hemlock, yeddo, and tiger tail spruce, dried branches and Christmas trees, as well as decorative wreaths, foliage and branches, and firewood of all species. The policy includes phytosanitary measures that may be used to mitigate risks, including import requirements, domestic movement requirements, inspection requirements, and also outlines our HWA approved processing facility compliance program. The policy also provides for movement restrictions where a written authorization under a movement certificate is required for movement of articles out of an infested place and um, highlights a high risk period between March 1st and July 31st to prevent spread during that high risk period. So within the agency, our unit, the Plant Health Surveillance Unit, leads the development and refinement of our visual survey um, practices for hemlock woolly adelgid and other pests. And we work very closely with our partners in academia as well as the Canadian Forest Service to refine our tools and techniques each year. However, currently we are still relying on visual surveillance aimed at early detection of HWA in areas where it's not known to be established. So basically we look at the area where hemlock is naturally distributed and we prioritize prioritize our sites based on a number of factors, which I'll explain. So this current data reflects all sites delivered between 2018 and 19, and that constitutes um, 225 sites nationally, and that was increased for our next year. So a few things we take into account when we're planning and prioritizing our survey activities. Hemlock distribution is an incredibly important piece, especially in Ontario where it's um, randomly distributed. Uh, we can't use a systematic approach. We have to go where the host is first and foremost. So based on that information, we then assess for areas at risk. So these priority areas are those in proximity to known infestations. So they would be provincial areas bordering U.S. states or other provinces that are infested. And then we build in the piece of migratory bird corridors where we could have a likelihood of birds migrating from infested areas into our hemlock within Ontario and Eastern Canada. So our survey methodology is an adaptation of the USDA's practices from Costa and Ankin. Uh, we conduct visual inspection for signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid. And we target three main site types, including nurseries importing hemlock from infested or regulated areas of British Columbia, Nova Scotia, and the United States. We look at urban parks and green spaces containing hemlock. So this would also be a connection to the potential nursery stock pathway. And then we assess hemlock forests within 100 kilometers of the US border. In some cases, we need to increase our detection efficacy by integrating other methods, so including ball sampling, branch sampling, as well as climbing with um, inputs from our partners. So the visual detection piece and the key um, signs and symptoms we need to look for are very important, as well as the, the timing in which we conduct this survey. March to May is the optimal period when bully masses are most prominent. However, we know based on the life cycle that that system's generation has broken at that stivation. It's now actively feeding and producing wool. So it's getting to a detectable stage at this time again. With each area we survey, um, the target trees are assessed by looking at the undersides, 
<clears throat> of two branches per tree and we look for ovisacs as well as adelgids on that outer one meter and we focus on that region because HWA tends to prefer to oviposit um, or sorry lay eggs on new growth. It's also highly effective to examine bark on the bowl of the tree because a lot of the old or new wool can wash down during rain events. And so we can look at fallen twigs on the ground. And it's a very efficient way as you're moving through a stand, if there are fallen twigs, um, the evidence of HWA will be evident if it's in the area. So when we assess a uh, large forest, we divide the survey area into four blocks. And we want to survey the block in a zigzagging pattern to ensure that we're randomly approaching the stand. And with each hemlock we assess, we basically walk a meandering pattern and assess the nearest hemlock every 25 to 50 steps, reaching a maximum of 100 trees per stand. Now, given that uh, the distribution is very clumped and hard to detect at low levels, it's important to spread out your sample points throughout the stand and also focus on edges of stands, waterways and trails that are more likely to be those wildlife corridors. So working with our partners at the Canadian Forest Services, we're always considering novel detection techniques because we know, oops, Sorry about that. We know that when present at low densities, hemlock woolly adelgid is difficult to detect um, as the population most likely occurs high up in the canopy. So it's hard for um, inspection staff to access that area. So we have been working with our partners at CFS as well as the Invasive Species Centre to develop these new tools and assess them and see how they can be applied to our survey. Fall and sticky trap sampling are potential early detection tools for new hemlock woolly adelgid infestations. And the preliminary research suggests that these techniques are more effective than visual surveys. So ball sampling, not only is it fun, but it's effective. Um, it works on the concept that if we shoot the Velcro balls into the canopy, we'll trap the wool from the adelgids in the Velcro. And you can see it's very evident here. Um, the goal is to hit at least three branch tips to constitute a good sample on your way up and down. And about 15 samples per tree will provide sufficient information to tell us whether or not hemlock woolly adelgid is present in the tree. So we have about a 70% detection efficacy and um, the data indicates it takes up to four minutes per tree with two surveyors um, casting balls into the tree. So the samples can then be retained for identification. And I'm also working on a research project with the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario through the University of Guelph to assess the capacity for eDNA analysis to detect hemlock woolly adelgid, so basically get HWA barcodes from the wool that is on those uh, sample balls. So um, stay tuned for the results of that study. Another novel technique is sticky trap sampling, which intercepts falling crawlers that become dislodged from the hemlock canopy. And with this methodology, two stakes are placed about 15 to 30 meters apart, every one kilometer along the edge of a hemlock stand. And those traps are installed with the peak of the crawler stage of the second generation, so that cistern generation. Um, which is more abundant. So those traps are left out for a short window, only five to seven days, and then they're collected, placed into Ziploc baggies, and then they can be analyzed under a microscope through the Ziploc bags. So again, we're just really going to um, hone in our search image. Um, when we're in the field, we're looking for egg sacs, so those cottony white woolly masses at the base of the needles. We're also looking for the nymphs, and these are, are best observed using a hand lens. They look like a fleck of pepper. They can be seen with the naked eye, but it's much easier under a hand lens. And then you can see that characteristic woolly halo that's forming around those nymphs feeding at the base of those needles. We also look for twig dieback and yellow needles. And again, that wool on fallen branches and on the bowl is very, very um, easy to detect if you're in an infested stand. So that's a great indicator. 
So when looking for Hamm Lockwoolly Adelgid, it's important to keep in mind there are some lookalikes that can be a little tricky to discern from Hamm Lockwoolly Adelgid. One is spider ovus back. Um, you know, once you get used to Hamm Lockwoolly Adelgid, you can tell by the texture and the look. Um, there's just a difference and it's quite apparent the HWA woolly mass has that sort of bright white um, bluish hue and um, it just has a different textural difference. Um, pine sap on overhanging white pine can drip down. Also oak skeletonizer on a hemlock needle. I've seen a lot of spittle bugs on hemlock trees so this is something that would definitely be encountered and could be confused. However, you can see the frothy bubbles. Um, and then elongate hemlock scale, which it is often detected in association with hemlock woolly adelgid. And this pest is actually one that causes a much more dramatic decline of a hemlock woolly adelgid infested tree. So the two working in tandem can pose extreme challenges for the hemlock host. Um, and then wool from white pine aphids, some of these we won't see as commonly. And also sometimes bird poop can um, just cue your eye into something white, but it has a very different textural appearance as well. So because um, a large number of us will be entering an infested stand later this week, it's very important to consider and take seriously biosecurity precautions. Um, the highest risk of eggs and crawlers is from April to the end of September, but we all need to be aware when visiting high risk suspect or infested areas, there are a number of safeguards we need to put in place to prevent movement of hemlock woolly adelgid out of that stand. So we want to avoid placing gear on or near hemlock trees. We want to wipe our equipment clean with an ethanol based cleaner. Lint rollers should always be part of your toolkit to uh, roll clothing once you've left the forest stand. Um, if possible, refrain from visiting hemlock stands in uninfested areas um, for at least a week. Don't collect any samples, uh, that's a given, but we just wanna be clear that photos are great, but samples are not. Um, bringing pets into infested stands can be high risk, so it's best to refrain from doing so if it's considered high risk. Light clothing um, could assist with detecting and removing crawlers, and then it's encouraged that all clothing is laundered prior to re-entering the field. And these photos are, are actually taken of my colleague who is doing some field work in the West, so you can see um, the wool is quite apparent on clothes and hair. So now we'll just review the status of hemlock woolly adelgid in Canada. So in uh, July of 2017, hemlock woolly adelgid was detected in five counties in southwestern Nova Scotia. And interestingly, extensive decline in mortality was noted at one location, and it's thought to have been established in this area for a significant amount of time, likely 15 years, and it was quite possibly a recent uh, drought stress event that kind of tipped the scale. So the trees went from looking not so bad to really terrible, and that's when it became more apparent. So following the 2017 detection, um, it was then detected in Kejimakujig National Park in 2018. So we have a really effective partnership going on with Parks Canada to help address this pest and mitigate the risk. So following these detections, it triggered a collaborative response in which a Maritimes working group was established um, to basically collectively work together towards some common objectives. And the Canadian Food Inspection Agency took on surveillance education, regulation, as well as outreach, while the Canadian Forest Service um, initiated some research on trapping, civil cultural thinning, trays and treatments. The province of Nova Scotia is working to monitor sites to track the infestation front, conducting aerial surveys and also some phenology studies to see um, how HWA is behaving biologically in Canada. Parks Canada has implemented a five-year management plan, including monitoring impacts, treatment options, civil cultural controls, as well as biocontrol. MTRI, which is called the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute, a nonprofit organization, has been exceptional in facilitating meetings, conducting outreach, citizen science, and surveillance. 
And that brings us to the historical detections in Ontario. Previously, we had detected two small localized infestations, one at an Etobicoke residence in 2012, and the other within the Niagara Gorge between 2013 and 2015. At both of these locations, the infested trees were removed through a collaborative effort. So again, it was tremendously successful due to pulling together and um, working towards addressing the risk. So in 2019, as a result of our visual detection surveys, the CFI confirmed hemlock woolly adelgid at two sites in the Niagara region. The first site is again at the Niagara Glen. So these detections were about four to 600 meters from the previous positive detections. At this site, hemlock is randomly distributed throughout a mixed stand. Um, so we're fortunate to have a great partnership with Niagara Parks Commission. So upon detection and determining the infested trees and the extent of the infestation, a notice of prohibition of movement was issued. And Niagara Parks Commission decided to remove those infested trees and burn them on site. So they helped um, suppress the population immediately. And then we'll work together over the coming months to develop a collaborative long-term suppression strategy for this site. The Wayne Fleet detection, however, is it's a more contiguous hemlock stand. Hemlock's fairly dominant at this site. And using our methodology, HWA was detected within about 20% of the trees that were inspected. Um, so again, at this site, to make sure that no regulated articles are leaving that site with the potential to spread hemlock woolly adelgid, a notice of prohibition of movement was issued by our operation staff. So in order to address the risk associated with hemlock woolly adelgid in Eastern Canada, we formed a hemlock woolly adelgid technical advisory committee with the intent to coordinate multi-government information sharing and actions associated with the detection and management of hemlock woolly adelgid in Eastern Canada. Our group strives to make recommendations, pool our expertise and resources, as well as facilitate and support research advancements. The committee provides scientific or technical contributions towards the management of hemlock woolly adelgid, and this can be through formal, informal recommendations as well as publications and supporting documentation. So we have a very broad scope in our membership, um, ranging from a number of federal provincial partners, um, as well as academia, and then organizations like the Invasive Species Center and Silvacon. So one output of our committee, um, led by the Canadian Forest Service, was the development of a hemlock woolly adelgid management plan for Canada. This is available as a CFS publication, and it includes a, a range of information on monitoring, removal, treatment, biocontrol, civil culture, response, outreach, and education tactics that may be employed for management of hemlock woolly adelgid in Eastern Canada. Several research priorities have been established for Eastern Canada to not only improve our understanding of how the insect is behaving and spreading in our environment, but also to ensure we have some made in Canada tactics based on best practices and lessons learned from our United States partners. Some of the research is focused on improving early detection and monitoring of hemlock woolly adelgid incursions. This is really important. Compiling a complete hemlock inventory um, is a priority because with the random distribution of the host, we can only effectively survey the areas that we know. So this is a key piece of information we need to inform early detection. We also want to improve methods for early detection at low densities. Some work is focused on systemic insecticides per for protection of high value trees. So comparing the efficacy of Imaget, which is an approved product for hemlock woolly adelgid in Canada, as well as triazin and other products. Um, we want to assess risks of non-target effects of metacoprid and leaf litter um, of treated hemlocks. 
what we do know with hemlock woolly adelgid is that we can't rely on any single tactic. We must have a range of tools in our toolkit to address this pest. So exploring promising predators for biological control is incredibly important. So that's why there's a lot of uh, collaborative work between um, Cornell and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and some of our other partners to collect and study hemlock woolly adelgid predators from Western Canada. Um, Mark Whitmore, a U.S. researcher from Cornell, is heading to do some field collections with my colleague Troy Komodo in British Columbia next week. And this all helps Mark to perfect um, lab and field rearing techniques and also gain a better understanding of what the natural predators are doing to the HWA populations. Um, the goal is to start some field trials with biological control agents in southwestern Nova Scotia. So furthermore, um, work needs to be done on identifying mechanisms and genes behind interspecific host resistance in eastern hemlock. So looking for natural host resistance um, in our southwestern Nova Scotia populations and across eastern Canada as more HWA incursions occur. Um, the goal is to perform some genetic and phenotypic studies on eastern hemlock. Michael Stasny at the Canadian Forest Services is looking at exploring civil cultural techniques to reduce hemlock mortality. So this includes both stand thinning to reduce HWA densities and mortality, but also looking at um, pruning as a means to a barrier to slow the spread and, and slow dispersal. Um, also, we hope that research focuses on assessing HWA population dynamics and impacts on hemlock in Nova Scotia. This work has already been initiated and is being led by the province, looking at factors influencing hemlock woolly adelgid population dynamics and monitoring rates of spread and dispersal mechanisms. So working with the Canadian Forest Services at the Great Lakes Forestry Centre, um, we've come up with a you know, 12 to 18 month to two year research plan for Ontario to form the basis for an Ontario risk assessment and pest response. This will help us to set the stage for long-term control via introduced predators. So a couple of initiatives that are being proposed are to develop a DNA DNA-based ID tool for traps, so basically a tailgate test um, that would be a plus or minus tool for detection or not detection of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, as I mentioned, a complete hem hemlock inventory for Southern Ontario is critical. We need to assess the ecological and economic consequences of hemlock woolly adelgid mortality and look at cold tolerance of new Ontario populations. First and foremost, though, we're hoping to evaluate chemical controls as a means to um, initially suppress the population and determine the best option for Canada, and then establish some hemlock rearing sites to support eventual biocontrol. So in the interim, we will continue to focus a lot of effort on outreach. And this can be in the form of signage. We have some uh, paper signs as well as metal signs that can be placed at high risk hemlock stands or um, ecologically significant hemlock stands to promote general awareness and foster early detection. So the goal of these signs is to show people what it looks like and encourage them to report it if they see it in the environment. We also continue with broad distribution of pest detection cards. These are a great way to give someone a take home message um, if and when you encounter people in the field. And these are tools that work well for school age kids all the way up to um, partners and um, citizens. We also work with the Invasive Species Center and other partners to do targeted social media to ensure that we're engaging uh, citizens in areas at risk and get messages out to encourage reporting and promote early detection. Through our technical advisory committee, we've produced some collaborative products. And the goal of this was to design a product that meets our collective needs. So a one-stop shop for all um, organizations to form an educational curriculum and have that toolkit if they want to um, promote knowledge transfer within your organization or beyond. 
and also citizen science. This is um, a great pass to promote via citizen science and reporting. So we've worked to have Hemlock Woolly Adelgid put into EDMAP so that the reporting capacity is there for Ontario and it also provides the context of the regulated areas. So if someone goes to report Hemlock Woolly Adelgid in EDMAPs, not only will they see it in the context of the established regulated areas, but there's also a defined a verification process whereby new reports outside regulated areas um, have to be verified and vetted uh, behind the scenes through all of the key partners before they are made live. And we continue to educate uh, everyone from our partners to our colleagues within the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and citizens. And I just wanted to highlight this one technique for education, and it involves um, simulating an infestation, which is basically the technique I had to rely on before we had confirmed hemlock woolly adelgid again in Ontario. And I want to highlight this because both of, or three out of four of our detections in Ontario were made by CFI summer students who had just taken a course and were trained using this technique. So basically the M&Ms, if that's a mystery to anyone, are used to um, pay off little kids to roll the tiny woolly masses and then those are glued on to select branches as well as foliage that's fallen to the ground to help um, fine tune that search image. So this is a call to action where we need to continue to build a comprehensive hemlock inventory. Um, it's currently incomplete with many gaps. And we just wanna highlight that any amount of hemlock can be reported in the form of in inventory shape files or percent hemlock estimates with coordinates. And we want everyone who can to spread the word. We need data for Southwestern Ontario. And thankfully, we have uh, Silvicon as a key partner in this. So inventory data can be submitted to Kathleen Ryan, who continues to build um, this excellent inventory to inform our surveillance and detection. And then one thing we encourage is uh, collaborative surveillance. This allows us to collectively report on our initiatives. It helps us to maximize coverage of the resource and provides for a complementary approach. So by surveying an area in accordance with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's detection survey protocol, we can then report on that and have a much broader sense of what's happening in the landscape. So for hemlock managers, um, we would encourage you to spend a half day maximum once a year assessing your stand in accordance with the protocol, um, complete the worksheet and submit your data so we can have that reflected on our maps and reports. So what can all of us do? The collective we, um, we can closely monitor hemlock stands for hemlock woolly adelgid. Avoid hanging bird feeders on or near hemlock trees is a great prevention strategy. Buying nursery stock and firewood locally is always good with respect to mitigating risks and preventing long distance dispersion of pests and then photograph it and report it if you think you see it. That's very important. We tend to mobilize uh, follow-up inspections quite quickly so uh, the sooner these are reported the sooner we can address it. And so for those joining us on the November 7th field tour, just a couple of key reminders. Um, we encourage carpooling as much as possible as parking is limited. So not only carpooling to the Long Beach Conservation Area parking area, but then we'll carpool from there as well. Um, wear rubber boots as the site is wet. Um, bring a hand lens as well as a camera because we're going to make use of these tools. And then just a reminder not to collect samples. So that's it for the formal uh, piece. And now I can open it up to questions or comments if there are any. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Erin, for that great presentation. I want to remind attendees that they can um, upload their questions directly to the chat box. Um, so we'll give it a, a couple of minutes for people to, to field some of their questions. In the meantime, Erin, um, I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit on the recommendation for citizens to avoid uh, planting bird feeders near hemlock trees. 
That is a great question, Lauren. So um, a number of key bird species rely on hemlock as their, their primary habitat. So we know that uh, some of these warblers um, who inhabit hemlock are key to spreading the nymphs. So those, some studies have been done looking at how birds, um, how the nymphs adhere to the feathers. And so by putting those feeders, we're encouraging a lot more traffic to come to those hemlock trees. So um, as a prevention tactic that is considered effective, um, so it's encouraged to place your bird feeders in other um, tree species rather than hemlock for this, given the pathway of spread. Okay, great. Uh, one other question that we had was, you had mentioned that in spring is the best time to see the woolly masses for the hemlock woolly adelgid on the hemlock trees. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit on what um, tour participants can expect to see this Thursday if they're attending the tour. Yeah, that's a great question. So even though that um, sort of March to May window is ideal when the eggs are present, so you can see those plump, um, waxy um, egg masses. Now the nymphs are present, so they're starting to produce the wool, so we will have the opportunity um, to see that apparent whiteness that is a good sign of hemlock woolly adelgid. You can also sometimes pick up uh, last year's wool. It's present in the landscape as well, but now we're getting back into a detectable stage where the cystins are actively feeding and um, growing. Okay, great. So those are the, the questions from the chat. So. Um, for anyone on the line, if you had a question um, and comes to you later, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, oh, and we just got one more in the chat box. So the question here is, what is the threat to deer and other wildlife? Well, deer, deer play dual role. Deer are considered um, potential pathway for hemlock woolly adelgid as they move through uh, the hemlock stand. The, they can take the insects and relocate them to new areas. Obviously, they have to be moved from a healthy hemlock to a healthy hemlock, and they have to be in the right stage. Um, but overall, we know that the ecological risk to deer is much greater as they rely on hemlock um, for habitat. So we know that loss of habitat will impact the deer and other wildlife. And hemlock is unique ecologically. So as that um, foundation species, that's where we'll see the impact at the ecosystem level with deer and other animals that rely on it for habitat. And another question that came in is, is the CFA reviewing occurrence records for um, the hemlock on iNaturalist? Um, we are doing our best to um, keep a handle on iNaturalist. Um, Lauren and David, we you could probably speak to this as well as we're currently working with um, the EdMaps developers who are in discussion with iNaturalist to help make some of the data speak to each other. So. Um, Actively monitoring, we do our best to look into some key pests, um, but no, we would expect and hope as well that people report through the official channels as this is a regulated pest and thus should be reported um, under the authority of the Plant Protection Act. Great, and in regards to using iNaturalist to look at the distribution of eastern hemlock, is that something that the CFA is doing as well? Um, we haven't done that yet. We're doing our best to gather inventory data through official channels, but this would certainly be a good way to kind of verify and also provide in additional intelligence that we haven't looked at yet. Another question is, is Triazin currently being used on any infested hemlock or is it being explored currently as an option only? Uh, tree, research on triazin is being conducted in Nova Scotia. The work is being led by John Sweeney at Canadian Forest Service, so it's supported by Bioforest Technologies, or um, sorry, they have a different name now. Someone from Bioforest, feel free to correct me. Um, 
but basically that work is being done on a research capacity. Um, however, HWA, I believe, is on the label, but a lot of um, efficacy work has not yet been done yet, so that's what's being done now. We're getting a couple questions um, from attendees asking if the presentation will be available for download. It will be available. Um, we're hoping to get it up on the Invasive Species Center's YouTube page by tomorrow uh, for those that are attending the uh, tour on Thursday. And so all registrants will be getting an email following this webinar as soon as the webinar is available to watch on the YouTube page. So stay tuned for an updated email. Um, another question from the chat box. For a private woodlot owner or small-scale manager who is wishing to incorporate HWA monitoring, uh, what survey technique would be the easiest or cheapest to implement and how effective is visual surveying? That is a great question. So I guess it depends on the type of stand would kind of be one aspect to consider. We know that visual surveys have helped us detect it at, you know, relatively, it's not heavily infested. Um, so we're relying on it and we consider it um, the first and foremost tool in our toolkit. That being said, um, the ball sampling technique is um, fun if you, um, you know, you want to make it a fun event that could certainly be used. And there is a prescribed methodology for all of these. For a visual survey of a woodlot, you'd be looking at a couple hours um, with a pretty straightforward walkthrough procedure that can be done. Um, if it's a very mature established stand where there aren't a lot of accessible branches, that's when you'd want to employ the ball sampling or even the crawler sampling. However, at this time, um, I think the ball sampling is fairly easy to do across the board. But if you don't want to have to purchase anything and you want the lowest cost, lowest maintenance version, that would be visual surveys and looking at the boles of the trees as well as um, the foliage on the ground. And that can be done in accordance with our protocol that's available on the Invasive Species Center website. Okay. Well, thank you to everyone who asked questions and for all of our attendees, it looks like that is a wrap on the question section. So thank you so much for submitting those. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a couple notes I mentioned at the beginning. Um, this webinar will be available to view on our YouTube page. It'll be, you'll get a notification in your email. Um, as well, if you are attending the November 7th um, field tour and you have any questions about your time slot or um, any clarification on anything, please feel free to send me an email. Um, my email is in the chat box and it will also have been on your webinar registration confirmation. And I'm happy to help with any questions. I want to thank Erin for taking her time today to uh, give us a bit of background on the Hemlock Willi Adelgid in advance of our tour and for everyone for attending today. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.